Excited about today's episode. We're going to be talking about working with celebrities. We have um, an agent out of Los Angeles who's going to talk, walk us through that. Thrilled to be with you all today. Uh, thanks for joining us on this episode of the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. We have something very special for you planned today. So stick with us. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. I'm your host, Justin Stoddard. Thrilled, thrilled to be with you today to talk about, again, working with celebrities. Today's guest works out of the Los Angeles market, has worked with household names that you would recognize. And we're going to have very specific lessons. They're going to help you know how you can work with stars, celebrities, as well as just increase your level of fiduciary and customer service in an era where clients are expecting that. Uh, please help me welcome, and I'll give a special welcome to Nathaniel John Getzels, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. So tell me, what is it like when you're sitting across the table from somebody who you normally see in movies? Like, how is that experience? Just kind of walk us through what that looks like. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it happens uh, more often than you think. Here in, in LA, you know, everybody's pretty much a, it's practically like everybody's a celebrity here. So, you know, you, you kind of have to, have to get used to it. You have to, uh, kind of reset your mind from that, you know, the, the, oh my gosh, that's a, that's this person too. It's a person, right? It's resetting to where everybody is a human being. Uh, obviously some, some people have slightly different needs than others, but uh, the first and most important thing is it's the same rule book that you had with your, uh, you know, with your other clients, which is especially the higher end ones, which is you just, have to focus on building an authentic real relationship with that person same as you would with anybody else right because at the end of the day you know they're a real human being that is looking to uh create a connection and then um that's the first thing you have to do in, in any relationship to uh effectively uh move forwards but especially in these because you know your that relationship becomes your currency that relationship is you know, what makes you different, what makes you special, what, why they want to come back to you. And you're not an exchangeable commodity at that point. I would imagine that uh, people can tell when other people feel starstruck, right? Oh. I oftentimes kind of talk about this in, in, in my book that oftentimes there's this relationship of being a solicitor to even mm -hmm. just a vendor. And then you climb the ladder to being a peer. And I would imagine that what you just described right there, Nathaniel, is critical that if you come in starstruck, it's really hard for them to take to, to, to really respect you as a professional and want to trust you when it when it looks like you're just kind of there to get a photo op. Right. Either there to get a photo op there to just, you know, uh, just to sell them something. Right. Yeah. Nobody wants nobody wants to feel like they're just being sold something. But especially someone who's a celebrity, uh, everybody's trying to sell them something. Right. Everyone's trying to pitch them or, oh, listen to my track or here's my this or here's my reel or, you know, so that um, that relationship is so much more important because everybody's trying to sell them on something, trying to pitch them. So if you can avoid getting into that realm, then then that's pretty key. In fact, I, I remember I was driving through Malibu and uh, we were sitting in this guy's car. And I mean, we're in the back of a chauffeured Rolls Royce at this point, right? And, uh, you know, we're just sitting there, uh, my client, his wife, and me. And uh, I, I've known him. I've built that relationship with him for years. But I had only met the wife more recently. And he looks over and he goes, honey, don't worry. He's like us. He's, he's, he's in. He's, our, he's in our group. You know, he's, he's one of us. Like... Meaning, not obviously, I, I didn't have a, a, I don't have a, a at the time, a chauffeured Rolls Royce behind us with my own. But what he meant is we have that connection, right? We're on that same mental level. We're on that plane. I'm not there just trying to sell them something or, or you know, make a quick buck off them. I was there to, as a, a peer or as a, you know, a partner in, in, in the project. Yeah, I, I, I would imagine that there's, being in that world, it sounds super sexy, right? To be famous. And it sounds like it's something that you would want. And I've heard of people who have, who are famous and they're like, it's, it's nothing that you would necessarily 
want, right? Now, some probably love it and are okay with it. Others are like, it's it's difficult to identify who are your real friends, who you can trust right. versus uh, so many that are not, right? That are that are simply there to get something for themselves as opposed to to a certain level of service. Um, these principles, um, Nathaniel, what, what, what have you learned? How do they apply just to non-celebrity clients? Because again, the purpose of this show is to help us really uncover um, the, these key principles of working with celebrities and then how they apply across even a wider gamut, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Well, and that's actually, I learned how to deal with celebrities, not with celebrities, funny enough. I learned with um, some very, very high net clients who I got very early on. And for me, I was like, oh, you know, they're worth hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. Like, uh, I have to act differently or how am I, how, how am I supposed to treat them, right? Uh, but it's the same principles. You build the relationship, they trust you, and then you have to be able to deliver good and bad news. That's, that's the biggest thing that a lot of uh, people, especially agents, that the mistake they make there is they don't realize that you have now been hired as the expert. They have made built, they may be built a, a 10, $20 billion company, but it's not in real estate, right? They might be the expert in, you know, selling whatever, the toilet paper, but they don't know how to buy and sell a house or, or position themselves to create the most wealth. So what you have to do is really become a trusted resource, um, whether it's for someone in business, entertainment, um, it's all the same principles. You have to become valuable by becoming a trusted resource. But before you can become a trusted resource, you have to build that relationship. So first you build the relationship, then you show your, your value, right? Your uh, value in the transaction. And then you also have to just create that flow or that vibe with your client because if they don't trust that you have the right answers, if they don't like you, or if they don't feel like they can connect with you, any one of those three is a deal killer, right? Losing any one of those three, especially in a higher end situation uh, with a more specialized client, you're done. They will literally, and I've had this happen, just hang up the phone, never talk to you again, and you'll see on the news they bought something somewhere else. What um, boy, incredible lessons, by the way. Um, and, and I think in this time where we have a shifting market, right, uh, mm -hmm. there are many agents who don't know how to deliver bad news. Um, now, some who have worked on the buy side have gotten pretty good at it, right, where they've had multiple offer situations and they've gotten pretty skilled at that. But others that have worked on the listing side, it's been a lot of good news, right? Yeah. Teach us some principles around that, right? Because if you can do it in front of an A-list celebrity, right, mm -hmm. who's been pretty used to having people tell them yes, Right. They've, they've kind of paid the price to get to that point to where a lot of people around them are, are, are saying yes. That's right. In fact, that's probably one of the bigger differences is with that A-list celebrity. They have not only used to be hearing yes, but they have a whole often team of people around them paid to say yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a big thing that um, you have to set expectations early on. Right. That's important. And you have to not be afraid to deliver the news. And partially, that's what you're getting paid for, right? If this was an easy job that was all good news, we would not get paid very much money at all, <laughs> right? So um, I like to set expectations early, right? Like, so for example, if I'm gonna list a house that I think is overpriced, I will first, I will always open with, uh, do you wanna list the house or do you wanna sell the house, right? Do you want to list it or do you want to sell it? Listing is, is great for you, but expensive for me and doesn't help anyone in the end of the day. It wastes everyone's time. So that's number one. I, I want to set their mind in a, in a good spot right, right from the get-go. You know, remember the goal, right? And then we talk about why they want to sell their house so they remember their motivation. And then what I'll do is I'll set, I'll set timetables. Like, well, if this house doesn't sell in two weeks, you know, we've tried your price, we are going to do everything possible to get that number. But if in two weeks, you know, we don't get there, then I want you to pre agree and maybe even pre sign here that we're going to correct the price. 
right? And that has to be done very gently because obviously uh, people will jump to, well, you're not going to try for the next two weeks or you don't think this is going to work. So you're setting us up for failure. But no, what you have to frame it as we're setting us up for success because we want to make sure that we don't miss any important timetables. That makes sense, Justin? Yeah, I do. Uh, it does. I love that setting expectations up front. And, and I think many agents haven't had the practice of saying on day one, if we don't get any offers or no activity by this point, let's go ahead and put this in our calendar now. It's a powerful practice, right? You're setting expectation is that, look, I'm not here to decide what news you get to hear. I'm here to interpret it. I, I, and I'm here to tell you what the market is telling us. And exactly. hey, if it sells between now and then, fantastic. Then we know that we got it right or that we were interpreting the market for that point. If not, we're, we're going to come back and we're going to reinterpret what the market's telling us now. I think um, if, if agents don't have that practice in, in play, I think it's, it's a powerful one that we all have to take a look at. And, and, and well, especially, especially now that, that the market's shifting um, because, you know, it's the same as if when you start an escrow with somebody, right? Uh, they're happy, they're excited, everything's good, everything's, you know, candy and jubilee. Um, and that's when you want to give them all the bad news also about the house, right? If there's, oh, well, there's something on title or, oh, well, there's this little snake problem in the back, right? We have some some major mongoose issues in the back end of the property there, but don't worry, you know, we'll take care of it. But if you do it at the beginning, everybody's still happy and pretty much accepts it and is still excited. But if you bring it in at the end, everyone's unhappy. They feel like you were trying to sneak something by. Nobody's excited anymore and it could kill the deal. Literally, that, you know, if you're, timing of the same news can kill or make a deal. So, you know, setting the expectations early is important because then it's not like they're, uh, you know, they, somebody feels like you're trying to pull a fast one on them, right? So that's, that's always setting expectations of anything up front with celebrities, with anybody now, especially in the shifting market where we are as, you know, listing agents, we're used to giving great news and saying, hey, we have 10 offers, right, in the first five hours, and they're willing to give you piles of gold for the house. Now it's like, well, you know, we have to be realistic and get back to we don't make the market. The market decides the price. You know, logic takes back in. I think also we're going to see a lot of agents who um, get, get fed a little dose of uh, humility there because – I watched some new agents come into the market and they sold houses within two, three days. And, you know, they suddenly thought like it was all them, which yeah. partially, yeah, you do have to be a good agent to execute deals. But if you come in in one of the hottest markets in history and you're selling houses, you have to understand the, 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 the context, right? So, you know, but one of the other keys setting expectations and also knowing that your expectations, you know, knowing what you're talking about, right? Because you have to really study that market a lot harder and know it, especially in the celebrity or high end realm where there's less comps where it's more custom properties where, you know, you might have a hundred acres in Malibu with creeks and, and valleys and who knows what that there's, not five other properties like that in the neighborhood or even in the zip code, right? So what? you have to understand value and understand how to see value even if there isn't a clear comp there waiting for you. What, um, how important is it to have a, like the right modality of communication, right? There's times you can text, there's times you can email, times you let's get face to face, times you can do Zoom, what do you decide as far as, okay, how, like, I've got some news here that, that they might may not want to hear. Right. You decide how you're going to deliver that to them. Is it case by case? Or do you have some kind of processes in place where we have time set up at my office to come meet, to discuss where we're at? Or what does that look like from a process standpoint? Absolutely. So bad news is uh, the most important thing to be gentle, how you deliver it. So not gentle, but clear and uh, consistent. So I always like to deliver bad news, either face to face or on the phone. Very often I'll do a video chat with somebody 
so they can, you know, we kind of build more of that, that connection because I know it's going to be bad news and we're going to want to discuss it. And, uh, you know, you don't want someone to feel like they could just hang up or run away, which when you're looking at them face to face and explaining it, I think they understand a little bit better overall. Um, but usually it's always, you know, direct. I never text or email bad news unless um, the only way I connect with somebody is through email, which is very, very rare. Uh, so bad news is uh, usually face-to-face -face or over the phone or digitally face-to-face. -face. I love it. What, um, I think it's great advice, right? That we, we need to pre-decide in advance. Okay. And, and probably personality-wise to some degree, I would imagine, right? Some people are are, are really require a different, a different feel, a different level of care. Um, you know, you, you talk a lot about um, kind of not just <clears throat> celebrity real estate trends, but also um, kind of the, how to avoid sleeper costs. Tell me about that a little bit and, and what might an agent be able to take away from our conversation today about sleeper costs? Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the biggest things that your clients will later be angry at you about is a sleeper cost, which is a cost that they have to pay for their home. For example, uh, heating, cooling, maintenance. Millennials have the biggest group of buyers that absolutely had no idea about these costs, about maintenance, right? And, and it's the biggest complaint that millennials have after buying a house is we had no idea how expensive owning this house was going to be. I had a client who calls me up and goes, I need to sell my house. And I said, okay, what, why? Your house is gorgeous. You love it. She goes, yeah, I love it. But for the amount of money that I spend heating my home, I could travel Europe for the whole summer. So she sold the house and traveled Europe. Seemed like a good choice to me. But, you know, <laughs> I, I had another guy where he bought a brand new, not brand new house, but a gorgeous, gorgeous house. Uh, it was his first house, millennial guy. And, uh, you know, it has a sprinkler system. And he decides, you know, he complains about every cost of that house. And I said, okay. You know, and I reminded him when he bought the house, hey, you need to maintenance this system. It's very important because uh, it's a high-pressure water system that is there to protect your house from a fire. So a few months maybe within a year, I get a call. Hey, I am traveling in Spain and apparently there's water flushing out of the front door of my house. And uh, evidently what happened is I sent my plumber over there. He goes, yeah, the uh, sprinkler system hadn't been maintenanced, had never been maintenanced at all. And uh, burst and had literally flooded a house they had redone six months before with about five inches of water uh, across the entire first floor of the house. Jeez. So, you know, and, and I understand he didn't have, and I asked him why, did, why he didn't, you know, do the maintenance. He goes, well, I didn't have the money. As he's sitting in Spain on his two month vacation in, in, in you know, Spain. So, it's setting the expectations and um, even in that situation, setting the proper expectations for home buyers to know the actual costs of owning the home past the mortgage uh, interest and taxes. So that, that's the biggest thing that your clients will come back and complain about. So if you set them up to prepare for that, it, they might not buy as expensive home upfront, but that's a client for life. Yeah. And that's, I think anybody that wants to build a sustainable business, not just collect a paycheck, right? And actually have a good life. There's nothing worse than having a client that's upset with you that feels like they mis, like you misled them, whether you were attempting to or not, right? And just the fact that that's the way it felt in their mind just avoids so much, so much stress. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you know, tell me like some celebrity secrets, like it's like celebrity real estate secrets, anything else that like would be really interesting for the audience to, to, to hear from you. Well, you know, um, showing homes is a little bit different for a lot of celebrities. I have one celebrity specifically who every time we'd show up at a house, the agent, the other agent who, uh, you know, is experienced in celebrity real estate, you think, uh, 
pulls me aside and goes, Hey, can I, can I take a picture with him? You know, can I take a picture with them? Can I take a picture with her? And it's like, no, what? <laughs> here to look at houses, not to get paparazzi in the house. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? And these guys, it was funny because, um, they would wear the masks outside of the house because uh, for, for privacy reasons, they didn't want people to know they were going into the houses. Uh, so what we ended up doing with them is we would just send, we'd, we'd set up appointments for houses they liked and we'd send, they'd send their, their team, right? And uh, so nobody would really understand who, who the house was for right away. But what we would do is then as we're going through the house, if we thought it would work, we'd get the buyer actually on video chat and just walk through the house, like video chat, for, you know, uh, and, and finding out if they like the house. And then if they like it, we would actually have them come in. But they were getting harassed so much, even just looking at houses, it's exhausting. I mean, it, so we had to think of some other uh, strategies to allow them to see homes, but with maintain their privacy as well. And the things that, that uh, we take for granted, right? Of not not having those kind of problems. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, that's why a lot of these homes, they have really amazing things. You know, uh, I've seen homes with uh, bowling alleys. I, there's a home nearby here with a 3,000 foot pool with an island in the middle, um, you know, <laughs> arcades, all kinds of things. But a lot of it is just, you know, you get to a point and you can't walk down the street yeah. and you need it in your home because you want to, to enjoy it and you want to have your family, you know, enjoy these things, but you can't necessarily go out to the, you know, local bowling alley. Yeah, that's hard. Different, different uh, level of success. Huh? Well, also um, you have things like, you know, the whole city of Hidden Hills over here, which uh, is for security reasons. Security has become a big much bigger concern recently uh, over the last, I'd say, at least five, six years. And you have whole cities that are guard gated where there's armed guards at every entrance and exit of the city. Right. Uh, so that's something else that's pretty unique. You know, uh, you don't see that historically or you saw the house Britney Spears just bought uh, up in the Oaks. There's it's the Oaks Estates. There's a armed guard at the front gate, and then there's a second gate to separate the estate homes, which are all the custom higher end homes, from the regular, you know, three to four million dollar homes. Crazy, different world, different world. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, one more question. Actually, two more questions. The last, yep. so se second to last one. What does a 50 percent society mean? You've got me curious. Oh, 50 percent society. Yeah. So uh, states like California are a 50 percent society, meaning more than 50% of the homes, the private homes in this state are rented. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming much more of a rental society than an ownership society, little by little, which is not ideal. It's not great for cities. It's not great for stability. Um, it also, I mean, from a wealth perspective, it really points out the importance of owning your property, owning your home. And, you know, um, one in six properties across the country right now are being bought by institutional investors. And those are mainly to be put in portfolios and set up as uh, rentals. So rents are going to keep going up. So then you're in a, in a state where more than half the homes are already rentals. And you're going, okay, now that, that cost is going to go way up, way, way up. And um, it's going to, it's going to change. I mean, it changes homes as an asset class completely, but it also, you know, is going to be a bigger wealth gap, which is a, a problem, you know, in the bigger picture. No doubt. I mean, if you look in um, Florida, I think uh, Goldman Sachs just bought a whole town. I heard that. Yeah. For anybody that's that's curious in, in following Nathaniel, learning more about him, there's a couple places that I want to direct people to go. Uh, if you go to Instagram, it's at Getzel's Group. So you, his, you see his name here up on the screen. Uh, G E T Z E L S at Getzel's group on Instagram. If you have questions about real estate in Los Angeles, I'm going to throw out a uh, phone number here that you can contact his, his firm 818-535-5337. We'll also put that in the show notes. Uh, but again, he's just a great guy to, to go to, to talk about um, not only real estate, but real estate trends in these areas of Southern California. Now, final question, 
that everybody that crosses the Think Bigger Real Estate stage, Nathaniel answers this question. Excited to hear from you. What is it that Nathaniel does to continue to be a big thinker, to continue to expand your possibilities? What does it look like oh, for you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm con a couple things. The first is I am constantly um, buying new properties in different places. Like oh, we just bought one in Batumi, Georgia. Um, that's going to be a STR, short-term rental. And uh, I'm also uh, recently put on the board of a company called Houselet, which is kind of like Zillow and Airbnb had a baby, a really pretty baby. And uh, it makes renting properties super easy, a few, just a few simple clicks, and uh, specializes in 30 to 90 day uh, furnished rentals, which is a, there's a big gap in the, that space. You can go longer, but it's a really exciting company. So I'm always looking at where the next phase of real estate's going and I try to get there first, right? I have a uh, private show that I do for a group of executives called First Mover and it's because I wanna always be a first mover in the space of real estate. And I love it. So good. First movers. That's a great, uh, great name for a mastermind. Good guy to be associated with as a guy. Great guy to follow the guy who's in those kinds of circles. So Nathaniel, again, thank you so much for taking your time and expertise and pouring into the Think Bigger Real Estate show audience. We're grateful for you. And uh, to all those listening here today, my final request is this. They are three simple words. You know what they are. They are go think bigger. Nathaniel, thanks for helping us do that today, my friend. My pleasure.